Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this panel session, Incorporating Online Work into Your Portfolio Career. We've had a fantastic day of discussion so far, looking at teaching, looking at Brexit, and really thinking about what the future holds. This session is very much going to be focused on performing and working online, recording, composing, all the, basically all the different aspects that we haven't talked about so far. Um, I'm really pleased that we have a fantastic um, group of panellists um, and I would like to introduce you to them now. So uh, joining me today, we have Laura Bettinson, who is DJ, producer, singer, um, does loads of exciting um, projects both um, in the UK and in non-COVID times all around the world. Um, we are also joined by Magnus Mehta, um, who is a percussionist, um, also a composer, producer, and interestingly has also recently started a record label. Um, Hannah Fiddy um, works in the classical and runs alternative classical um, and is um, doing all sorts of interesting projects and taking classical music out into um, all sorts of interesting places. And we have Mike Burgess as well, who runs Sound with Mike and is working with and developing young acts and artists and really helping them get established um, in the sector. That is my interpretation of what they do, but perhaps I could just ask our panelists to to say a few words and maybe just talk a little bit about sort of in pre in pre lockdown pandemic times sort of what what does your portfolio of work look like so perhaps we could start with Laura sure yeah hi everyone um as Sarah explained yeah I'm a producer a DJ and a vocalist uh day to day I work largely on my own in a home studio um the um you say I love working remotely um so uh I do that and then pre-COVID times, I would be touring, uh, DJing across the world, um, which was a lot of fun, but obviously it's been quite different the last 12 months. Uh, and I do a lot of remixing for other artists. I do vocals for a lot of DJs and producers in dance music and I am uh, published by Ninja Tune. So I also do a lot of sync composition and things for adverts and brands and TV and film. So I kind of have lots of plates spinning at all times, but it's all rooted in electronic production. Thank you. Um, and perhaps Magnus, that's the other um, performer, kind of what does your portfolio of work normally look like? Um, hi everyone, how you doing? Um, yeah, I come from a, originally like many years ago, classical music background and did a degree in classical music in Glasgow um, and started working professionally in, like, in the symphony orchestras that are up there and started a bit of a career in that, but then kind of got bored of it quite quickly and started traveling um i lived in cuba for six months and started learning about all the percussion and the music in cuba and i got really interested in that and it put me on this big journey in like groove groove music percuss percussive based music and i've traveled to places like morocco and uh in india and um tanzania and lots of different places and have built up this i suppose reasonably unique approach to percussion um and as a result of that, I started a project called Peña, which is my band. And that's led me from becoming more of a, from like being a freelance musician, doing sessions and touring and playing in bands, orchestras and playing film soundtracks. And I've kind of gradually morphed into being more of a, a producer, composer, who's um, producing work under the name Peña, which is my band. So it's been this gradual kind of evolution. So I still work as a freelance musician um, and that's probably where I earn most of my money. But the production and band leader composition side of things is like increasing more and more. And, and like lockdown has been a big, um, uh, it's forced me into an area of like to, like to sort of put my cards on the table and say, well, this is definitely what I want to do. Let's just go for it 100%. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically a rough, a rough starting point. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. I mean, lots of interesting things there that I think we will pick up in the discussion. But uh, next, perhaps we can go over to Hannah. Um, and yeah, how, how does your work normally look like? Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Fiddy. Um, I also keep lots of plates spinning, so I'm gonna see if I can keep this short. Um, so I'm the co-founder of Alternative Classical, um, which is all about diversifying the audiences for classical music and really trying to interest people mainly in their 20s and 30s um, in going to see something and also encouraging classical music in all kinds of different venues, taking it out of the concert hall, putting it on outside 
um, really thinking about how do we slightly change that experience so it's not just purely about the music delivery and going to hear um, great sound, but also how can we have all these other elements that we can bring into it that makes it a really great night. Um, and I'm as well as that, I'm a digital consultant. Um, so I run the social media channels for the composer John Rutter. Um, nice. And I do lots of work with kind of essentially getting bums on seats. Um, <laughs> so lots of digital work. And I guess compared to a lot of the music sector, I've probably been quite fortunate in that because I was a digital person anyway, and I was essentially remote and can do most of my work in the cloud, I was fairly set up um, beforehand. And I have lost some work, but also other things have developed over the, this, this last year. Um, one thing that has changed for me is that I did have a co-working space because when I first went freelance, I just found it really hard just being isolated and just got very in my own head. And I realized after a while that it'd be quite good to just be around some other people. Uh, so I finally got that set up and loved that. But then of course we had to go back to working at home. So I've had to re-navigate that and pick up some of the things that I had learned from the first time around when I did it. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Um, and Mike, uh, yeah, tell us a bit about your work. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mike Burgess. Um, I run and operate an organisation called Sound with Mike, and um, I work in many different capacities effectively as a consultant. Um, it mainly in two areas these days, in a sort of marketing and strategic planning um, and in business affairs. So I do a lot of um, getting people out of bad contracts and advising people on what a good contract should look like um, and connecting people with lawyers and legal advisors and that kind of thing. Um, and I do a lot of rights management work as well. So I'm very adept at finding money from PRS and PPL and MCPS and various other organizations that should be paying you your royalties in whatever capacity it is you do things in the music industry. Um, and I work very closely with those organizations to ensure people get paid properly. Um, and I effectively, I offer kind of by the hour service and that's how I, how I work with musicians. Um, interestingly, my background sort of actually touches on almost everything that Laura, Magnus and Hannah have said, um, but I, I won't go into that for now. But um, I guess sort of credentials wise, yeah, I've probably, particularly in the last seven or eight years, worked with probably over a thousand musicians across the world, different, different territories, mainly in the UK, um, advising them in different capacities. Um, and yes, and some of you may know my face uh, from some bits and pieces I do with the ISM as well. So yeah, that's me. Brilliant. So to kick off with, perhaps I could ask our panellists, um, sort of over the course of the last year, you know, when when the pandemic and the first lockdown struck, sort of how did your how did your work evolve online? Sort of like what what did you actually do online? And was that by accident or by design? I can kick off. Um, so the first thing that happened for me and I definitely didn't plan this it was just came out of a drunken conversation where I was talking about chat roulette if anyone remembers that app from the noughties um, mm -hmm. and classical music and I started thinking well what's going to happen what's the, going to be the call to action for classical music now that we can't because everything I've done in, uh, in my career has pretty much been you know buy a ticket to come to this concert and I thought well with that taken out completely what is the new call to action and it is essentially going to be streaming. So what can we do to make that something interesting? And if you don't know anything about classical music and you go to Spotify or you go to YouTube, you're going to end up with the same five or 10 pieces that everyone knows. So I thought, what can we do to kind of randomize this and take out that part that people always get stuck on, which is that I don't know what to look for. The names are really long. I don't know how to spell any of this stuff. Um, you know, you just want someone else to recommend you pieces, basically. So I made something called Concert Roulette um, and you just land on a random concert somewhere in the world that's on YouTube. Um, it was yeah, pre-recorded um, and you can choose to sit there and watch it. Or if you think this is absolutely not my thing, you just press another and then it just takes you to another concert hall somewhere around the world and you watch something else. Uh, and I just sort of made that as a almost as a hobby because I was just in my house more and I thought, you know, this is the kind of thing that I find really fun. So I just did it as a little fun project, but it's now been played in over 90 countries by thousands of people. So it really just took off and actually Japan has been the most popular place and I don't even know how that happened. So <laughs> that's been exciting. 
Fantastic. Perhaps I can ask Laura because um, you performed at South by Southwest um, back in March. So, sort of, how did that all come about? And and sort of tell us a bit about that gig. Yes. Well, so I basically, and we were right about. I'm in another band called Ultraista as well, like another side project of mine. And we were about to release an album, or well, we did release an album right at the beginning of this, the lockdown. So we played a, a gig on the 13th of March in London, in Rough Trade. And then like a week later, we were obviously, or a week or two later, we were in full national lockdown. So um, our whole album campaign kind of got completely turned on its head. And l- luckily we'd had enough time to pre-record a lot of like our rehearsals and stuff like that, um, which were, you, were actually meant to be intended for us because we were a band of three people split across three different countries. We very rarely have the opportunity to get together for a long amount of time. So we tended to film everything so we could have references for when we get back together to remember how we played our, <laughs> our set. Um, but actually they ended up being, that content ended up being really, really useful um, for promoting the album because suddenly we, it's as a band especially, um, you know, DJ is a bit easier to tour and you can do live streams, but band, we really relied on promoting that album through touring, like through, through doing live shows. So that was uh, quite a challenge um, like just straight off the bat, really, to start thinking differently about that. But um, I, in terms of my actual day to day, I was um, I've always worked remotely anyway in my studio, so it really hasn't changed for me that much, you know. And my product productivity level has probably gone up because I haven't had the amount of distractions that usually come with, you know, the meetings and the the show, the shoots and the shows and things like that that pull you out of your creative kind of mindset. Um, so I've actually had a very productive and successful year, um, which is totally unexpected um which you know it's been a really po- real positive for me um and then just recently we did south by southwest online um which was a completely different experience i have done south by southwest twice before in the past in uh, you know in, in real life completely different experience it's a whole festival that relies on you know bumping into people in the street for a drink or you know grabbing some amazing street food and then like stumbling into a band like by accident and things like that you know so to have the whole thing online I thought oh how is this it's not going to work is it how's it going to work but actually the feedback we had from like you say we did a pre-recorded performance and it got live streamed across across the globe and uh, a lot of people tuned in to watch it. And we've had amazing feedback from it um, and probably more opportunities, weirdly, mm. than what we might have had in real life at South by Southwest because in the, at the real life event, you tend to get those few buzz bands and everybody jumps on them and tries to see them. And in weird ways, I feel like we've had more opportunities and more exposure through the online thing because people could just find it in their own time. So that's definitely also been a positive. And what about... Um... Magnus, sort of like how is how is your how is your year gone? Uh, it was really tricky to start with um, because uh, I'm someone who's uh, earned all his money from from playing for quite a long time and um, taking on long 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 contracts um, uh, and doing sessions and things like that. Um, and the production side of things is something that's been building gradually for for five or six years and going quite nicely. But these things do take take a while to get to a, a level where you're earning enough to not have to do the thing that you did before. Um, so that's cool. And it's been working on it. But at, at the time that this all happened, it was just like no work at all. And also had an 18 month old little baby boy to look after. And my wife's like a theatre producer. So at Shakespeare's Globe. So that was just like a big explosion of panic because it was just as their season was about to announce and it all just got canned. So it was quite sort of stressful in that just in a practical sense but also I was just we just had a PRS fund load of funding from PRS my band for like making this the momentum award you get some money to make your next album because you've shown that you have some promise and I just spent a load of money on studio time but the relationship with the label that we're on had just gone completely not good so I just spent all this money on studio time and the record kind of was just about finished and I suddenly didn't have a label and uh and it was just like oh my goodness like how am I supposed to deal with all this stuff all in one moment and uh but I just kind of uh, I'd had a few other deadlines like doing some remixes and stuff like that so it just everything just seemed to go really fuzzy really quickly particularly with like childcare as well and uh but eventually I kind of just pieced it together over the over the over the period of lockdown and um have set up like a, a label structure of, of my own um to put the music out on 
um so like getting distributor getting uh getting just just getting a much closer relationship with fans um uh you know setting up relationships with 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 uh vinyl manufacturing all this kind of stuff it's quite art finding the right artwork concept there's quite a lot of stuff there that i would fancy doing but hadn't done um because there was there's a label there they can pick up some of that work blah 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 so that was like a really fast and really intense like learning curve that i went through which i actually ended up really enjoying and and now we've we've now sort of opened the pre-order the albums out that i'm talking about sort of out i think in about 10 or 12 days and like been quite a successful period you know we've came on the radio we sold quite a lot of records already and streaming's been reasonably good so and i actually started another project online at the same time which has gone really well and it looks like we can actually sign it to quite a significant label now and that's like a whole new project so it's been really really intense and like but um so from being like really hard like this huge uphill sort of struggle and now now i'm like now because i've had to really focus it feels like things have fallen into place in it actually in a way that it, it wouldn't have done before lockdown because i've had to really get myself together you know and that so that's i'm feeling quite positive at the moment but i haven't it's been really hard i mean it's so it's so encouraging that sort of out of out of the most dire circumstances actually kind of all of you have been to found a new a new creative outlet and i'm wondering sort of mike if that's been mm. across your clients and sort of what yeah. you know what you've been seeing yeah i mean it's really interesting hearing sort of particularly sort of laura and magnus's stories there because i think they're very reflective of of client experiences and stories that i'm you know i'm hearing of as well and i think there's been, yeah, um, there's there's been a number of lows for people. I absolutely agree. And I think, but equally, there have been a number of highs and a, a lot of, you know, I was saying this to Sarah last week, you know, I think that there is always opportunity in crisis. And I think that it's about, you know, not, I appreciate that maybe not everybody has that that mentality, um, but I, I do think there is opportunity out there. And actually, sometimes when things do grind to a halt as hannah was saying about um the chat roulette model with the concerts a great idea you know just being mm. able to actually also and again i appreciate this is not you know maybe what everybody's experience has been but sometimes having that time to go okay everything's car crash okay everything stopped and just be able to take that time and go right hmm. and actually sometimes that's when the ideas flow is, is when we break away from the norm I, i've certainly found that with myself and other clients and certainly it seems across the board with everybody else where there's um there's been those moments where it's like you know okay i've you know things that are normal to me you know going and having meetings with people as laura was saying face to face and okay all of that stuff stopped and you know magnus has had this issue with the label and hannah's like kind of event work has kind of ground to a halt and in a way it's great hearing everybody's experience is just the fact that it's been like oh you know we need to we need to adapt and and find find a way around that and i think it's really particularly inspiring to hear what magnus was saying again very similar to client experiences that i've heard of which has been you know okay a label's pulled out on us or okay i had a client recently his management just decided to just leave them literally within about three weeks of lockdown and i was like hang on a sec like you know firstly there's probably a breach contract issue there but equally it's more of a you know that's really like really concerned me because from that artist perspective he'd been with this management company for a number of years and they literally said to him like, you know not quite verbatim but you know look there's no live income coming in this was a dj producer um there's no live income coming in so sorry we're off and it was like and i i made this point and laura will probably agree with me about this with electronic music there's far too much reliance on live and dj set income and not enough consideration around recording rights and publishing rights and exploiting those properly um so <laughs> i don't know it's been interesting seeing again how different genres have adapted to the the current sort of situation over the last year or so um you know having worked with classical musicians and jazz musicians and, and different people through the ism you know seeing their experiences versus seeing um, people in you know UK rap, grime, hip hop, drill having very different experiences to people in house music, techno, and drum and bass. It's been very interesting to see that. And um, but equally, I would say that um, it's interesting. As I said, hearing everyone's um, stories and journeys, and actually, I would say that's very much indicative of what I've seen my end working with people as well. You know, some real like, oh God, what am I going to do? But then equally, that time to go, ah. You know, and I'm there to discuss that with people and, and other peers and people in their network as well, just to say, right, well, what about this? Maybe we should try something a bit different or just have a bit of a gamble on something like Hannah did. And, and sometimes kind of genius sparks come out of that. So, 
there's an i think there's often an element of like um firefighting sometimes when and always trying to catch up and um i certainly was for me particularly if you're a freelancer and gigs always come in well often come in last minute and then you have to shift everything around and then something gets put on the back burner and you're like oh no i'll do that but i think having like a full stop of like just stop like just stop stop firefighting like just like if the thing needs to burn down and let it burn down so that's, that's it. um and uh or something like that and and um for me it's like I'm, I'm actually quite to be honest i'm quite grateful for it like just 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 like stop and have a think you know it was really it was really i never, never would have expected it but it was incredibly useful is that the same for you, Laura? Because yeah. I feel like you've been recording and releasing like a, a huge amount of music over the past year. So has it has the has the balance shifted, and that now you're much more focused on on writing music at the moment? Um, for sure, yeah. But I think actually one of the I was always really prolific anyway, and like I say, because I've had my studio in my house always, it's never been an issue for me accessing it or you know just getting up every day and really treating it like a job. But I've certainly because of the pandemic, I have been more structured in my day-to-day -day, um, work day, essentially. You know, I'm at my desk every day at 10, and I tend to work latest until 6, and then it's way more structured than it used to be, whereas, you know, I'd be snatching hours here or there, um, and then you'd have trips away that would get in the way, so you just have so many unfinished projects. I, I'm a producer that hates having <laughs> unfinished songs. Even if it's song, like, if a song I'm never going to, re like, release, I, I just like to have it finished. I hate the idea of something having not seen the end of something. Um, so yeah, so it's been a really a welcome pause. Like Magnus said, it was the pause certainly that I needed. And also, I don't know if anyone else suffers with this a little bit, um, but as an artist in the industry with social media and especially in electronic oh. music, um, like you're kind of in constant comp or well, you feel like you're in constant competition with, oh God, so-and-so is on that lineup and so-and-so is flown to, you know, Mexico this weekend to play all those shows. And, and weirdly, like it was a really good leveler. It was like, everybody's mm. grounded. It's like, Great. no one's going anywhere in some ways. And it was like, it was quite a relief for my mental health as an artist really to just be like, ah, it's just, it was like, I think it's the thing that I didn't even really was weighing on my, know that I was weighing on my shoulders. And you know, it's silly really to compare yourself to other people's careers and things because everyone's on their own path. But it was quite a relief just to be like, okay, cool. Everyone's kind of, everybody's going through a big shift. Like even the massive DJs are going through a huge shift and figuring, you know, because they've lost mm -hmm. a, a huge amount of income, those DJs that were just relying on, you know, those yeah. huge massive shows every weekend. So like everybody's life has been, gone through a big shift in some ways and uh, I think that was quite I found that quite comforting actually um just knowing that we were all dealing with something you know no matter how big on what level um mm. yeah do you think there's more resilience sort of in in that world say compared to classical I mean certainly when uh, Hannah and I were talking ahead of the the panel session there was a real a real sense that sort of um you know classical certainly maybe hasn't been as far forward in terms of digital as other parts of the industry so Hannah can I ask you to pick up on that and just yeah talk us through your views sure yeah I think I was actually quite um excited by what could come out of this and I think there's been so much acceleration and speed that has come out of this that may have taken the industry decades otherwise to get to this point Agreed. because I think a lot of the industry We've just been sort of hiding under a rock and just relying on that kind of live experience, which is really, really special. And we all want to get back to that. Um, but I think, you know, I've been fighting for a long time saying that we need to bring, so, you know, there's a lot of the industry that even isn't on social media, for example, and it's not treated as such an important thing as I think it is elsewhere, that there's, I think, more understanding in other genres that you need to be able to bring your own online audience um and create your own own community of fans and bring them to the concerts um so i think there was a bit of a scrabble suddenly that it was like oh what are we gonna do because we haven't spent this time developing digital stuff and it's a completely different model and you won't necessarily want to sit there and watch you know buy a ticket for something that if you can just go and watch it on youtube um what's the incentive to then pay for a ticket and watch it live um, and maybe people will do that for kind of a novelty value or for supporting artists and, you know, all these other great reasons. Uh, but we need to make this sustainable. And probably what you want to get online 
it needs to be a different experience from if you're going to miss out on that experience of sitting in a concert hall or going to a venue and standing among, you know, a massive crowd of people and having a drink and all those other things that suddenly if you're sitting in your living room, what's going to stop you from just checking your phone or from going on, you know, going on your inbox and then your mind is suddenly elsewhere. Um, So, yeah, I think from my perspective, I was quite excited to see. I mean, obviously, it's been really, really tough for the industry uh, because we had so much reliance on uh, the live experience and selling tickets. Uh, so yeah, it's not at all been easy, but I think we needed to go through this process and I think we probably wouldn't have got here unless our hands were forced. So in some ways, I think it's probably, uh, made, yeah, just, just made people think about it a bit more and start thinking about the long-term thing. I know there was a lot of discussion at the start about, there were so many music musicians that were essentially just streaming from their living rooms and they just had this real kind of desire to perform for audiences. Um, And then there was a lot of discussion around, well, are we now just giving away this art for free? And what does that now mean for the future of the industry? Will people pay for it in the future if they can see it online? Um, Hmm. Yeah, so that's that's another interesting one. I think that's definitely something we should dig into at this point. I mean, I'd be interested to know whether Laura or Magnus, you, you, you know, tried doing online gigs at all. And if so, sort of, where did you do them? How did you do them? You know, did, were they a loss-making exercise? Were you able to generate some income? Yeah, go. Yeah. Um, well, firstly, I think I, I've just looking at a few of the industry discussions that uh, that you know you, you jump into bits and bobs on YouTube and stuff, and uh, I think a lot of the, like the bigger artists with their live streaming like thing have found that they can make a lot more money than they ever made on the road because they didn't have to take a crew on the road and they can play to their entire if they've got an international fan base they can put a thing on and someone just needs to pay a tenner and it's like some some of these um so i've seen a lot of testimony from these artist managers and artists who have just said like wow this is amazing like um so if you can command that audience um it, it seems like a really smart thing to be able to do um and, and, you know, it, there's all sorts of amazing special experiences that you can create for people. And also, I think, like, Bandcamp now are doing it as part of their... Um, they've been, like, beta testing it for a while, but I think... I'm not sure if all artists can do it yet, but, y- you know, you can sell tickets direct t- to, to, your, to your followers on Bandcamp. So if you have a, if you have a, a following that um, buys your records, a lot of physical records and stuff, then you can, you can do a show to them. But yeah, we did we did one um, at the start of our album campaign in a little venue called Folklore uh, in Hackney, which is a nice, really nice small venue. They did it well. We kind of didn't make loads of money on it. We sold like maybe a hundred or so tickets, um, but it was part of a promotion for the album. And um, it was like an experimental thing. Like, how do we do this? How do we make it good? We partnered with a like with a a really cool company called drift studio who do who are really good on the visuals and the venue are a lovely like grassroots venue so it was just a lovely little community thing to do and it just getting in the room and doing it was just having not played for i don't know how long it was a year it was just an amazing feeling like at, at buzz then it was a pre-recorded and we broadcasted it live on youtube and then we were sort of in all the whole band in our laptops you know in our different houses kind of in the chat in the chat room talking to fans as they were commenting on our on on the show and it was it was a small audience but it was it was really nice um and that's certainly not something you get to do is see people reacting to your show in real time as you're 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 there as well that's quite cool um and also just interestingly um i know that my wife she, she produces shows at shakespeare's globe and they're they're about they're thankfully putting on their reduced capacity new shows over i think over june and july and they might even be opening in may and as part of that, they're also offering like a live stream thing. So you can buy tickets to be there, but you can also you can also buy a live stream ticket. And so maybe these things are sort of there here to stay now if, as 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 an element. Because if you're in like Hong Kong or whatever, and you've always wanted to go to Shakespeare's Globe, and you're fascinated by Shakespeare, then you why shouldn't you be able to pay a bit of money and just watch it a live show as it's happening? It's like a pretty I think that's pretty cool. And also it, it will it will help build the thing, the whole thing anyway. So then if you go and do a show in Hong Kong, there, there might be some people there that have watched a bunch of your live streams. Um, so I, I think it's quite a cool little thing. Yeah, uh, equally, yeah, Sarah. I, I mean, when lockdown first hit in March, I went into like 
you know, immediately, oh, I just want to keep sharing music and DJing to people. So I kind of saw it without this thing called Isolation FM is what I called it. And it was just me in my studio, D- like with a DJ stream and kind of as, as a hybrid set between a DJ set and a um, like a radio show. I would like take the music down and talk a little bit about the tunes that I'm playing or, you know, like give if they were my tunes, talk about the story, about how we wrote it and how the whole thing came together. And it was a beautiful, very like intimate hour every week on a weekday with fans around the world, which was beautiful. But equally, after a while, I was like, hmm, there's no way to monetize it on Instagram. I went to Instagram because that's where my largest audience is. That is where my following is, you know, 30,000 followers or something on Instagram. So that's immediately where I went. So I was like, well, I'm going to have the best chance of the most people seeing it. But then, like you say, there's no way of monetizing it on Instagram. And it took me a while to be like, hmm, now I am just giving content away to a to a platform that I have no access, you know, no way of monetizing, which was a bit weird. So then since then, uh, I kind of stopped doing that really as regularly. Um, I still like to do it occasionally, but I haven't done it for a while. And then since then, every live stream I've done has been partnered with somebody a lot bigger so I did one for Amazon Music that was watched by 10,000 people that was obviously amazing production levels were super duper high we did it in Metropolis Studios Um, and I found those to be my most most successful live stream performances have been when I've partnered with and somebody that already has a kind of guaranteed audience because I I had no interest in starting a Twitch channel for myself and like playing to 12 people and it taking a whole year to get to like 200 followers on, you know, like I just didn't have the energy to do that. I would rather be in my studio making tunes and, and releasing them than try and like become some kind of live streaming sensation. So I've definitely found partnering with more established platforms to be more successful for, for me. I was just going to jump in at Sarah. I don't, I don't know if yeah. you mind me. Just yeah. ask. Just I, I just had a thought. I was just wanted to match something that Laura was saying. Maybe something that that Hannah um, might get onto. I was just thinking about this idea around you know audience conversion and and actually, you know, if we're doing it on Instagram, as you said, yes, it's where the most people are. But actually, um, monetizing it's tricky. And I always go back to this thing of like you know the problem with these platforms is we don't own the relationship with the customer or with the audience member. And actually, this is why I know it's so old school, but to still bang on about like having SMS data, like literally fans, mobile numbers or email addresses is still so, so valuable because it's times like this where we go, oh, God, um, I've got to beat the algorithm effectively to see as many to get as many people as possible to see my content. And then there's the whole thing again of conversion to actually, okay, so X amount of people saw it, but then did they click the link in the bio to my new release that I was promoting throughout the show and that kind of stuff. And then it's quite an interesting conversation. And I suppose, or I, I was just thinking maybe from Laura's perspective, I just thought it'd be an interesting one because I'm sure there will be some people watching and thinking, Obviously, like I'd really like to partner with some bigger platforms and that kind of thing. I was interested, just like from my perspective as well, um, like what you've kind of seen as a sort of a follow on from that in terms of like impact, whether social numbers grew or whether you kind of see more people streaming, you know, the week or two after that. I was just wondering whether there was any kind of knock on effect that was obvious that we could maybe discuss yeah i mean it was it's definitely hard to gauge because the data we get from streaming services is not t- detailed enough necessarily and I'm not today. different and you know it's not like you can just log into one hub and see the whole thing we just yeah. can maybe but um yeah so it's really hard to gauge but certainly like I say the south by one was loads of just industry opportunities so yeah, lots of lab- labels got in touch you know I haven't had I had a few messages from fans and people like sharing it on Instagram mm. stories and things like that so that, and they were more music fans but like most of the impact of that South by Southwest one was industry opportunities the Amazon one was now they just support every release I put out so you know Amazing. so it's definitely paid off in that sense you know I mean lots and lots of people watched it I have no idea if they actually converted into like coming to be you know, follow me on Instagram. Yeah, I yeah. don't think they really did, to be honest. But um, <laughs> my relationship with Amazon has improved tenfold. Right. Yeah. Means yeah. They support a lot of the releases um, since I did that with them. And that's kind of the same, um, you say, with Spotify. It's, it's hard to gauge that. But I've just kind of been on, I had one tune out basically this time last year, April last year, a collaboration with Odessa and Golden Features, who obviously... Mm-hmm. pretty big names in electronic music they launched yeah. a new project and that was the lead single on there 
album and that really for me it's a song now has had 28 million streams on spotify and god knows how many on other platforms yeah. but it really like kicked the algorithm up the ass for me <laughs> and it's kind of changed everything and it's what hard it because you can't get ever guarantee that you're going to have a song that's that popular obviously but it was like yeah. it was really eye-opening because before that you put out a few you know put out your singles and it's a real struggle getting those numbers up real struggle getting any of those platforms to really put you on those any of those big playlists mm -hmm. but as soon as you have one track like that and you belt man it's like it's just changed my whole career honestly um, yeah. and the the support i've had from all the streaming services since then has just been on a completely different level to what it was before I had that one tune that was obviously been so successful. So that's been an interesting experience and not one that I'd had pre pandemic. Cool. Thanks. This is a, a, an opportune moment to take, uh, we've had some questions in from the audience. Um, and one is what advice would you give to a relative digital newbie? How do you go about reaching international audiences? I mean, I, I'm happy to talk about that, but I'm conscious of, Hannah could equally, I'm sure anyone could. Go for it. No, you go for it. Mike, you, you start off uh, and uh, we'll go to the Okay, other. cool. All good. I mean, I was just going to say maybe from a from being a newbie to, to the sort of digital world, I think to an extent it's quite easy to get um, overwhelmed by the idea of trying to reach an international audience and trying to reach multiple territories in any one go. And actually, I do think there's still something in, despite the fact that these tools technically permit us to reach an international audience, that there is still some sense in actually targeting specific territories if possible. And I know that's not always easy, perhaps with social media, because it's kind of whoever's seeing it is seeing it. Um, but I think particularly around, um, you know, if you were interested in kind of engaging with social media and maybe that is TikTok, Instagram, um, you know, as sort of the leading platforms, if you like, these days, where if you really want to get kind of eyes onto your art your your music they probably are the best two at the moment um but in many respects if you're going to run some ads um and again and it sounds more complicated than it is you know just to kind of boost a post and to try and you know maybe just try spending 10 pounds or 15 pounds to try and reach a certain audience in a certain country and it might be something as simple as reaching women aged 18 to 25 in you know I know Eastern Europe, for example, um, or women aged 18 to 25 in Eastern Europe who like a particular artist that's maybe considerably bigger than yourself. You know, that that sort of stuff is built into the back end of particularly an in Instagram. Um, so it's it's never easy to be like, OK, which specific territory is going to engage in my music? Who's going to really love what I do? It's always a bit of a, um, you know, there's a lot of market research that I think that kind of has to go into those decisions if you're going to spend lots of money on that stuff. But, you know, um, Everybody that I work with in, in the marketing world, you know, when advising new artists, I always say, look, sometimes it's just worth trying to spend like £10 here or £10 there and just see, you know, see what performs well and maybe try running the same boost on a post um, of like a little video clip or um, an image or a little carousel, a little deck of images. You know, try that to different um you know, men, women, different age groups in different territories and just try spending £10 here, £10 there and see what performs best. And actually from that, you might then have a like, a, oh, OK, it's quite apparent to me looking at the data that this particular segment of um, a potential target audience really want to um, engage. So I'm sorry if that got a little bit technical there, but hopefully that just gives some idea as to kind of boiling it down um, and not thinking like, oh, I really want to reach as many people as I can in all over the world. Obviously, we all do. Um, but sometimes it's nice to just go, can I focus in on people in Mexico that are aged between X and Y? Because I know that certain other artists have had quite good traction there, perhaps from, from their streaming numbers or um, from seeing maybe different blogs or different radio stations, perhaps playing them um, in those places just through Googling and, and having a look online. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah, certainly through my, I've found that I've connected more with international fans through collaboration with other artists. Oh, so if I do a remix, yeah. I've just done one recently with a Finnish band, done a remix for them and it ended up on playing a lot on, you know, Finnish radio that would not have really ever occurred to me. You know, I've ne I would never run a Finnish promotion campaign for my own music, but it's nice that it's been picked up there. And, and that's only come about because I've been collaborating with the Finnish band who obviously have a little bit of a fan base there. So I have found that um, throughout my career to be 
like to see immediate results from that, you know, doing remixes for other international artists and uh, and then that kind of leads on to other opportunities and then, you know, and relationships essentially opens a few doors for then you to send your next releases to those people and, and kind of keep those relationships up. Have collaborations with, you know, a band in Finland or, you know, I mean, for Hannah Magnus as well, sort of like, how do you, how do you sustain and develop those relationships? Um, you know, yeah, digital will, will offer more opportunities in the future. Yeah, it's really, uh, Laura's, what she was saying about collaborating and remixing and stuff like that. We had a, I, I my music is, is very, very niche and it kind of sits on the side of quite a few different more commercially powerful genres and um but it's always been interested that we've always whenever we release something a producer or someone will often come in from a much more sort of commercially viable sector and we've, we've kind of like gradually we're kind of like jumping our way up the hierarchy as it were so like for example like there's a, there's this uh our music has like a latin american influence in a lot of it and um when we released our first record there are these producers called dengue 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 who are like two peruvian uh producers who live in Berlin got in contact and said, well, really love your stuff. Uh, can you do a track with it? So we did a track with them. Like, and it was like a lead lead track for their EP. And uh, it when it, it was like, it jumped up to like half a million streams like really quickly. And it's been one of their more successful tracks. And from there, they remixed us and they did a really lovely remix. And we're now working with them on like an EP, which is going to be on, fingers crossed, um, this new label that I've started. So... I, I think often you have to take a cue when you put music out there, you you take a cue from what comes back because you get, I think you get a calibration and a triangulation on, on who your audience might be and who the producers are that you have something in common with. And also like, you know, for us, it was like, there were a few people on like six music that, that played us regularly. And then you can just jump, you know, you, that's great in itself, but you can just jump into the playlist that they're putting you in on the radio shows and like, listen to, the eyes they're putting you next to and just get this picture of where you're sitting in the industry and, and where and where your audience might be um and yeah that what mike was saying about the whole um social media <laughs> advertising thing yeah it's 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 befuddling my brain still because the actual getting inside the uh, the facebook ads manager and that is a whole subject and i've tried doing some courses and stuff but it's one of these things that's like along with producing music and and, and get your artwork sorted and getting your shows sorted and the other stuff. It's like, I've got to have to go and dig into Facebook ads manager now. Can someone just do this for me? And, it, and it, yeah, it's a bit of a pain, but it's really, it's really, it's, I think it's kind of important to get into that stuff. You know, it, it, it's just, it's a big, it's a big amount of work. I'd love a manager if anyone's out there. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like now is the point to bring back, uh, bring back Hannah into the conversation as our sort of digital marketing expert. So, yeah. uh, yeah, kind of what, what's your take on all of this? Oh, I feel like I could talk about this topic forever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I guess something that's really interesting to me about all of this is just thinking about what, what are your reasons for uh, trying to reach an international audience? And I think we all have this idea that we have to kind of go viral or we have to suddenly have hundreds of thousands of uh, streams or followers or whatever it is. Um, I know that from what I'm doing, I have quite a small audience compared to say Laura, um, but it's a really engaged following. Um, and I suppose I'm trying to work more on that model of a hundred true fans. I don't know if you know about this. So if you can yeah. get a hundred people who will pay you say 10 pounds a month, you've got your a thousand pounds to be creating stuff. So you could think more around that idea and how do you develop that really small but engaged following as opposed to, oh, I've got to suddenly, you know, take the internet by storm. So Concert Roulette, I don't think I had intended it to appear like that. It was just that um, I released it at a point where no one had any content and I sent it to all the orchestras and all the opera companies and whoever else I'd included in Concert Roulette and just said, look, I've included you in this, people can stumble across your content. And of course, they were really happy to promote it to all of their followers because they had nothing else to say at that point. <laughs> like, Here's some great news. Um, so that was really great. I didn't know if they would do it, but I thought, right, I'm just going to send it to you guys. And I'm just trying to help you all out by getting some uh, more views. And they were all over the world. And then it sort of just snowballed. So I wasn't necessarily going after that international audience. Um, I've just started something recently called Humans of Classical Music. So I've asked um, someone creative 
every Thursday I've got uh, kind of musicians, podcasters, comedians, actors. They've all spoken for one minute about their favorite piece of classical music. Um, so every Thursday I release a video in the morning and with a link to listen to the track. Uh, so it's just that idea of getting a recommendation from someone else. But because I've picked people from different industries and from all around the world, and they've all got their own pockets of fans as well, then it taps into, uh, yeah, just different groups of people. Um, but I suppose a lot of niche content also it does find its fans it's really heartening to know because a lot of my stuff i guess is fairly niche and it just comes from some you know inner thing in my brain that i think i'm the only person interested in this but let's just i want to just see if i can get this out into the world and it's so amazing when you're like oh wow this has actually resonated with lots of other people and then it, it encourages you further down that path and people will find you if people there are other people who would be interested in that you know weird thing that you're thinking about um and somehow that all just that does work but i think there's also this idea that it you expect it to happen overnight and a lot of my stuff definitely that has not been the case and i am now monetizing my content um but it, that has not, and it's also, okay, I had people from say 90 countries on Concert Roulette, but that directly has not paid me any money. Um, and I think there's this, so I have one way I have of making money is I have a, a buy me a coffee page. Um, and that was just sort of an experiment to be like, is anyone out there who, you know, enjoys my content and realizes that to support creators, most of the time they're not being paid to do this. So it's essentially a loss leader. Uh, if you're thinking about it in business terms um and you know occasionally people do drop me a coffee but i have to really like plug that in order to get anything and also it's like three pounds at a time so it, we're not talking you know i'm not suddenly getting millions coming into my bank account but it is lovely when there's i mean there's strangers there's, you know people's names pop up and i'm like i don't even know who this person is so but it's nice to know it's got to reach someone <laughs> Okay, so on the topic of um, monetization, we've had another question from the audience, which is sort of what the panel view, you know, what, what does the panel think about donations versus ticketing? If you're talking about monetizing content, you know, whether that's a live gig or, or anything else that you're doing, sort of, yeah, what would you go for? Donations, ticketing, one of the other models that's out there? Uh, for what? For live streaming events? Or for, yeah, let's do still with live streaming to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think ticketing with an option to kind of tip more. I mean, there's you know to give to give more money if people would like to. I think it seems reasonable to you know. But I, I think I think if you're going to charge tickets, you have to try and make something a bit special about the event. But that doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be super complicated. Um, but yeah, there's. Yeah, I, I think I think I think they should be ticketed, but uh, yeah, but there's other. But there's so many different types of content. Like there, you can like for different platforms. You know, we try to do little things on Instagram that just keeps things ticking over, uh, which might be like forty five second things or whatever. But you're obviously not going to charge things for that. But then it can that can drive people to your to your to your link, your bio link, whatever, when they can buy your record. So it's kind of difficult. It's, it's difficult to give a, a solid. A sort of like absolute answer it depends like on the specific event do you know what i mean like or, or there's different types of content for different purposes i think yeah for me it's like definitely i would prefer that we all just as a standard had them ticketed because i hate this mentality that musicians are somehow like charity cases you know and it's like really it's hard when you've got the entirety of recorded music available a click of a button on streaming services for free accounts you know you can still have free accounts on most of these platforms it's really hard to you know it's too good it's too good for everybody you know i love streaming things and it's, it's it's too good but then if we take live in that direction too and we just become kind of charity cases i'm like i don't know man a lot of us are going to be out of jobs pretty quick um so i would be keen yeah just for everyone as standard to be like yeah, if you're watching a live performance, even if it's streamed, you know, you're, you're paying for it and it's ticketed. And even if it's not very much money, but, you know, rather than just take the donation thing out of the equation, you know, we're not, I, I really don't feel like we're charity. And I, don't, I feel like reinforcing that narrative is very, um, it's not a good route for us to go down, really. But that's just how I feel about it personally. 
I, I think as well, possibly like on, I, I agree with everything that's been said just for the record, but I also think around the the kind of live streaming thing. I think what's been really important for some of the clients that I've advised is one thing that sort of rem I keep coming back to in my head as we've been sort of having this conversation, which is this idea of, I think any kind of live stream should have a cap on how many people can engage with that. Now, obviously that's difficult to do on social media. It's nigh on impossible to do, but if you have managed to take that off social media, you have managed to convert people from doing enough free events or using your direct marketing list or whatever it is to try and get people to a, a third party platform. Ideally, there would be some form of cap on that. Because again, if you think about supply and demand in any business, if it's just a never ending availability of like live shows, which anyone can tune in and out of, as kind of think Hannah was saying right at the start of the conversation, you know, uh, can people could just pick up their phone or go and look at something else while it's going on. If, if people have been meant to, if people have felt it's a special event, it is an experience that is not available elsewhere. And there's a cap on how many people can engage with that. I believe that that will generate more um, demand effectively. It's a sort of supply and demand model from any kind of business scenario. But if it's just this sort of never ending availability thing, I think that creates problems. And um, we've implemented this in a few in a few kind of campaigns that I've been involved with sort of behind the scenes where we said, actually, let's try and cap it to, you know, a couple of hundred people available to buy a ticket at five pounds or three pounds or whatever it's been. Um, and it's really worked with sort of more niche artists because it's driven people to be like, oh, if I miss this, I'm, I'm never going to see it again. It's not going to be on demand. It's live stream only. And actually, that's really helped generate particularly like kind of sort of on day when we announced that that's helped drive sales initially, which has been great because then you're actually being able to sort of project roughly sort of earnings um, or potential earnings. Um, Equally complete opposite example, uh, an agent friend of mine told me that uh, an act of his that's doing particularly well at the moment, still fairly niche, but doing particularly well, it's quite hype at the moment on, on streaming platforms, on social media. They put a, a ticketed streaming event um, online recently. <laughs> they did 96 grand in about two hours or something in terms of ticket sales on this thing. They sold 15,000 tickets at five pounds, which is an mm. insane amount of mm -hmm. tickets. Yeah. Um, the sad thing about that is that event then had to get moved because it wasn't COVID safe and it wasn't going to work and they had to like refund everyone. It was a nightmare. But it's interesting, I think, the sort of different scales of things just to give an, a, a sort of a, a different opinion, I guess, as to some thoughts. So I guess taking that all together, kind of do you, do you envisage that you will be doing more live streaming in future? So Magnus and Laura. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely it's going to be something I incorporate into um, into my you know business model for sure. It has to be, and also I do think there's been a real awakening during the last twelve months, especially in electronic music, and you know to being greener and more like environmentally friendly. Amen. So yeah. many DJs were flying to like three different countries in one weekend, and. I think there's been a real positive movement to like, mm, maybe that wasn't that <laughs> like friendly to the environment and maybe there's better ways we could do this, you know? So I think there is a bit going to be a bit more of a conscious kind of um, thought process when like, I, certainly when I'm looking at tours, you know, and it won't be flying to China if you could do that, you know, via a live stream and, you know, spend the, the fee that you're getting on just making the production amazing and, you know, making that live stream amazing, you know, so it's definitely, it has to be something that um, that I incorporate into my business model, I believe, because um, I'm keen to be a bit more, you know, eco kind of conscious uh, when it comes to touring here on out, you know, we all need to be really. Yeah, totally. Um, I think with, with what we're doing, um, I think it is going to, I, I don't know about like live streaming per se. I think, yeah, I think it will definitely be a part of the, the industry going forward because people have worked out that you can make, you can make money from it. And, and it's quite a cool thing. If it's, if it, as Mike said, if it's made to be very unique and there's all sorts of ways you can twist it. And I think that's really interesting. Um, uh, but I've also been, we've also been talking a little bit about the Patreon side of things, which is um, really interesting. I think Jordan Rakai is an artist I look at sometimes mm. and he's some really cool stuff. On, and, I, you know, lots of people have been doing it, but I, as I say, I play a lot of niche percussion instruments that a lot of people don't really know much about. And, we've re and you know, we know a lot about, like, all sorts of different types of traditional groove music um, within, within, the, within the band that we have. So it's like, why don't we try and um, 
create some some depth in that for people that are interested and um, create coming out maybe from YouTube, but also then just like getting trying to get people behind the wall in, into Patreon and building up like um, the the story of what the band is and the rhythm and uh, and and the kind of depth of, of knowledge that that is in those rhythms that we play. So you know whether it's like teaching people how to play these instruments and no one knows anything about, or presenting bonus content or like letting your certain fans have the stem so they can do their own remixes just for people who pay for that content who want to come in a bit closer to you and then you're you're just deep because we find that we have some fans that are really committed and really love what we do and it's just like those are the people that i think is worth investing in you know a relationship with that's that's kind of why we do it so yeah yeah so we have two minutes left and I'm very aware that we haven't got through all the questions and I don't think we are going to have time to. So if you have asked a question that we haven't answered um, and you would like an answer, then please email events at ISM um, so that we know who you are and we will endeavour to get uh, your question answered. So could I just thank our panellists very much indeed and maybe just ask them to sort of sum up one thing if you were going to talk to our audience and give them, you know, one bit of advice or one thing to take away, um, sort of ask them what that would be. So I've, 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 I've got, got so, oh, sorry, Laura, after you. <laughs> no, I don't I, want to go. I'll, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go, fine. All right, oh, cool. Mike, Mike. All right. So this kind of actually, this was something that, for full disclosure everyone else is going oh god what's it going to be but no magnus sparked something off in my head before which is this idea of i think in short we're in a very strange but interesting time and my my opinion and i've seen this in practice through clients that i have is is reach out to people and reach out to people that you otherwise wouldn't normally reach out to because we're all in this together like there's been a leveler as laura said and actually you know not everybody's busy, 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 as we once used to think we all were. You know, there's an element of it being leveled. And actually, you'd be surprised at the people that will get back to you because some people are sat at home trying to deal with childcare and trying to deal with other things. And actually, they're, they're welcome for a little email from someone that they don't know, asking a nice question about maybe they would you collaborate with them or could you give them some advice or whatever it is. And actually, I've seen some really great results from, from people doing that. So reach out would be my advice. Fantastic. Hannah? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, this idea that I think we've all gone through the peaks and the troughs and there's been really hard stuff and we're all trying to figure out how to do it. And I think, you know, you go on social media and instantly you see everyone else's successes and people are, oh, this person has launched this thing and this person's won an award and this person has been, you know, asked to do a solo here. And I know that there's so many other people for whom that's not the case and we're all just you know, grinding away and doing what we can. And I am really keen to support people that we all kind of work together and we're not working in silo. And yeah, I totally agree. It's been a complete leveler and the connections and the networks has been uh, one of the best parts. So I really hope that we can continue that going forward. Yeah, um, like echo all of sorry, that. Laura, you go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just say echo all of that. And for me, from an, say an, an artist perspective, it's like, you know, let go of any of those hangups that you might have had pre-pandemic about like your career having to go in certain, you know, tick box kind of directions. Because I feel like the blueprint has been totally blown apart. We're all mm. on our own individual paths, and you know, if it brings you joy, keep doing it. You know, mm. so there really is no kind of one way to do this anymore. Magnus. Yeah, no, um, with all the difficulties that we face with uh, monetizing what we do, I, I'm, I strongly believe there's never been a better time to be an independent musician um, um, if you can get on top of, of the challenges. Um, just the anecdote I'd like to leave is that this new project that I have is based around um, file sharing with a musician in East Africa, Tanzania. Um, and a producer in New York and our and our band here in London and we've been pinging files. It was just during lockdown, like the second month of lockdown, we just started pinging files to each other, and then a four, three or four months later, we were like offered a really good record deal with like quite a much bigger label than I've ever worked with before or been able to get close to, and it's like, you know, who would have thought that it would take lockdown not being able to do anything, not being able to do any shows, not to be feel miserable and like be running out of money to put me into a situation when something like that could happen to me, which 
So as hard as it's been, I do think there's a lot. I, I agree with what, what everyone said, but, but what Mike said there about reaching out to people and 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 just realizing that that there is a there there is a community out there that really love love doing this, and you can find people to work with and build something. Brilliant. I feel like that is just the perfect uh, way to round off what has been a really inspiring and uplifting session um, <laughs> after the doom and gloom of Brexit this morning, which uh, it doesn't look like is going to be fixed anytime soon. It's fantastic to have so much positivity. Um, so thank you all panellists very much. So thank you, Hannah, Laura, Magnus and Mike. Pleasure. And thank you. Do stay tuned for the final session of the day with our presidential trio. Thank you very much. <laughs>